My name is Thibaut Damour and I, I work mainly in gravitational physics with its connections from cosmology, black hole physics and string theory. I'm not sure most people know what are black holes, they have heard the word, but actually it's a very subtle concept, it took 50 years to understand uh, what it is. It is a region of space where there used to be a star but the star collapsed and it is replaced by a highly curved region of space-time and inside this region actually space-time disappears. So it's a very violent uh, prediction of Einstein's theory, what is a black hole. And binary black holes uh, have been recently important because um, the detection of gravitational wave signals by the LIGO and, and Virgo um, interferometric systems have given us the first quite direct proof that uh, black holes exist and have the structure predicted by Einstein's theory. So the basic idea of the effective one-body approach was Instead of describing the dynamics and the gravitational radiation emitted by a binary system was to replace this complicated problem by something that looks simpler. For the, the motion, one is replacing this by the motion of a very small particle, a test particle, moving in some unknown space-time and the method computes this unknown uh, space-time structure uh, from the knowledge of what is known about the two-body problem and then um, this method allowed, uh, contrary to what most people thought uh, could be possible, to compute um, the, the motion of black holes up to the moment where they coalesce, where the two black holes touch each other and become only one black hole. And this method predicted what was the complete gravitational wave emitted during the motion of two black holes, their coalescence and after the coalescence. So the effective one-body method is, has developed into a tool which has several applications. One of them which is developed by people like Alessandra Bonanno and my other former postdoc, uh, Alessandro Naga, uh, is to refine the computation of the gravitational waveform emitted by coalescing black holes using this method. My own interest recently has been to see the connections between uh, the classical effective one-body approach to the binary black hole and the quantum approach to uh, the quantum scattering of two black holes. I gave a seminar in the Instituto de Physica Teorica on this. One has to understand that the basic idea of Einstein's theory, you know, before Einstein, the notion of space was something which the Greeks had described uh, more than 2,000 years ago which is what would remain in this uh, room if, we, if everything disappeared, if all the objects and everybody disappeared. People imagine the space would remain and space would contain like uh, triangles and if you have a triangle the sum of the angles of the triangles is equal to 180 degrees and there are rules of Euclidean geometry. And for 2000 years everybody assumed that this is geometry and this is space. And Einstein said no, space is something, uh, is, a, is a physical structure which is flexible, like a jelly. Okay, so you have to imagine that space is like a jelly and many things can happen in an elastic medium like a jelly. If you move it somewhere there will be waves propagating in the jelly. These are gravitational waves there are waves propagating in the elastic structure of space-time and black holes are kind of holes. If at some point you tear apart too much uh, this jelly, you can create, you can destroy the jelly and this is what happens inside the black hole. The LIGO and VIRGO are now joined by a Japanese system called Kagra and soon to be joined by the Indian Observatory. These are a kilometer size interferometers. Interferometer means you have mirrors which are separated by several kilometers and you have one mirror let's say from in the east-west direction and another two mirrors in the north-south uh, direction and you have a laser light 
which bounces between those mirrors. And then when you recombine the light that bounces between those mirrors, you can compute what is, um, with very good accuracy, the distance, or at least the difference between the distance of this arm between the two in, uh, uh, mirrors and, and this distance. And when the gravitational wave passes, because the mirrors are put in the jelly of space, as the space jelly moves around, the distance between the mirrors changes, and you can see this in the, inter in the signal of light recombined, which gives an interference, and the fringe of interference is a measure of the gravitational waves. The first um, and maybe most important information was that black holes really do exist had assumed that uh, there were black holes created in galaxies and that, that there were binary systems between an ordinary star and a black hole. And there was good evidence that these were black holes, but you could not really uh, prove that these uh, were black holes in the sense of Einstein's theory. In the case of the observations of LIGO Virgo, where you see two black holes moving around, emitting gravitational waves and coalescing, and then you have the signal after the coalescence. All this information is the best proof we have. First, that black holes exist. Second, that gravitational waves uh, uh, exist uh, and are uh, emitted by such systems. And third, that Einstein's theory of gravitation is uh, the best description and the, the unique description we have today which uh, explains all this. As I said before, the basic idea of generativity is that space becomes a flexible structure like a jelly and what it means in practical terms, okay, at, at school we have learned this theorem of the Greeks that the sum of the angles of a triangle must be equal to 180 degrees. This theorem is true only if there is no matter around. What Einstein is saying that if I have a triangle and if in the middle of the triangle I put some matter like a ball of dense, uh, some dense metal, then the sum of the angles of the triangle will be now larger than 180 degrees and the difference with the prediction of the Euclidean geometry is proportional to uh, the mass and inversely mass that you put in and inversely proportional to the radius in which this mass is contained. Another striking prediction of Einstein's theory is that time also is flexible in the sense that before Einstein uh, time would, was supposed to flow uniformly everywhere at the same pace but if you sit near a mass like on the earth then in a sense time uh, goes more slowly than if you are very far away from the Earth. And if you have two atomic clocks that are located at these two different things, two different heights, indeed it has been checked that uh, when you compare them, they do not show the same time. So Einstein's theory is not only a theory of gravitation, but it is a theory of space and time being uh, deformed by matter, energy, and mass. What would be something important, but it's not clear that uh, LIGO will be able to see it, is stochastic gravitational waves, uh, which means a background of gravitational waves emitted from the cosmological evolution. In the 60s, one has discovered the cosmological uh, microwave background, which is the the remnant of the, the light emitted during the early stages of cosmology. And um, we think, although there is no clear prediction about uh, what is the amount of gravitational waves predicted also as a stochastic background from the early cosmology, that probably there exist gravitational waves uh, which, have, uh, which are random and which have been uh, created very early during the cosmological evolution. So, it would be uh, a nice breakthrough if one could see this background. Uh, I should say that recently, another detector of gravitational waves, which is made of uh, the timing of very accurate pulsars in our galaxy, has given evidence that there exists this stochastic background of gravitational waves. Okay.